auditorium for their school. It's a very, very nice venue. I've been there loads of times. So we're going to be there at six o'clock, and we're trialling it out. So it's not, you know, it's not permanent yet, but if it works, it will be because we need somewhere to be for the next sort of five to six months until the roof of We the Curious is repaired. If anybody doesn't know this information, because you're back from uni, um, the fire, uh, a fire um, happened in the roof of We the Curious. One of the solar panels apparently caught fire, which is a bit of a worry, isn't it? Um, so that building has not been, we haven't been able to enter and go and meet there. So anyway, so next week we're going to be at the Cathedral School. So tell everybody that you can. We want as many people there so we can get a good feel as to how workable this venue is going to be for us for the next five, six months. The other very important piece of information is that Alpha is starting next Wednesday, the 4th of May, at Woodland Central. It's not a meal, it's more like cakes and coffee. It's a bit more stripped down in the summer. I'm going to be going, so come and join me. Um, but it's starting next Wednesday. You can book yourself on online. You go onto the Woodlands uh, website slash alpha and you can go onto a, a kind of a, an online form and fill that in. The other thing I need to let you know is that this weekend something very exciting has been happening, which is the noise. And I'm going to hand over to Sam, who's going to explain a bit to everybody what happens at the noise and what he's been up to, why everybody who's been at the noise is so tanned this evening. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, we, I don't know if we're going to have photos or not, but we had, uh, this weekend, a whole bunch of us, about 35, 40 of us, um, have been out, um, oh, here we go, a slideshow, moving pictures and everything. And there was a team today up in North Bristol as well that were doing practical projects, random family fun days, all sorts of good things. Um, it was amazing to be out of see Catherine was working incredibly hard. That garden got transformed. Um, and that is Naomi coming into shot any moment there. <laughs> So, Tilly has agreed to answer some questions with 40 seconds notice. So, big round of applause for Tilly. <laughs> so, Tilly, you and the team, we were out there on Saturday all day. What did we get up to? What sort of things were we doing? Um, what was happening? Um, yeah, so there were um, yeah, some groups from Southern Knoll, and some of us were doing um, Transform Your Basketball Court, doing some litter picking. Um, some of us were sort of running a family fun afternoon um, that sort of had loads of crafts and bats cars and lots of cake and stuff. Um, and it was just, yeah, really great. Yeah. We also had um, some spray painting of bollards that was wonderfully done. Um, and then another team, uh, this team transformed the garden where the brand was legit, like eight foot high. It was crazy. Um, they did an amazing job, worked really hard. Um, so we had a lot of us down in the West. What was it like being in a different part of the city that um, a bunch of us actually, um, that might have been our first time down there. What was that experience like to be in the community for the day? It was really nice just to be able to get out of a church building, but to spend time together. So I think most of my day was spent with my small group, and that was a really lovely way that we could do stuff sort of together, and work on our friendship, but also do something sort of outside the church building that was sort of different and actually was really beneficial to the community and so many people sort of came up to us and like, wow, this is all free, why are you guys doing this? It's actually just a really great way to like cultivate conversations and sort of just chat more about why we're there. Yeah, amazing. And shout out to a little lad with Alfie, a six year old, what a legend. He um he went home, saw with him went home, got some gloves from his dad and came and joined us and litter picked for like three hours straight. He was an absolute legend. Honestly, he picked up more litter than me. Um, uh, uh, yeah, he, he really had did me. Um, so, yeah, you kind of said about being there with, uh, we had a couple of different hubs there, um, kind of a real community vibe. What was that like, being outside of the church building, but still with the church family? What do you think that does for us as a, as a community that we get to do that sort of thing? And Tilly's face tells you that I'm very curled right now. <laughs> so, yeah. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, it was just a great way that we could... Um, yeah, essentially the noise is to love people and love people practically. And it was a really great way that we could show God's love in the community. Um, yeah, and it was just really fun and it's just, yeah, it's something we can do every year and just 
do something a bit different, but in a really fun, churchy way. Love it. <laughs> fun, churchy way. Go, a big round of applause. It's so that we love, we've learned the noise um, kind of ever since we started at the church. It's um, an amazing thing for us to do. So each year, look out for it next year. Um, we'll go even bigger next year and we'll go transform another part of the city together. So thank you to everybody um, that you've seen on this slideshow on and behind us. Thank you for your hard work. Um, and thank you for being up for being part of the church that um, says we're going to not just. Um, we're not just going to stay here in our building or in somebody else's building, but we're going to go and show God's love in practical ways. So I'm going to hand over to the worship band now. So if you want to stand with me, um, Alexia and the team are going to lead us in time of worship. Thank you. 
kind of thing that you want to sing out in your own words, in your own voice? I encourage you to lift your voice now.
20 past eight. Um, okay, and I'm at the door and she says, Hi, Ellie, I'm just leaving. I'm just leaving now to watch a movie. I said, Suze, it doesn't take 40 minutes to walk to you. Um, and there she goes, she leaves me all alone. Um, and I see her walking off in the distance and I'm left by myself. Um, and since that day, we've not been to uni together ever. Um, it really has broken my heart, um, but I have chosen to forgive her. Um, because I believe that there is, um, there's more to life than walking. <laughs> Um, he told us that there are 59 
verses in the Bible where we are told in some way to one another, one another, and uh, a quarter of those are love one another. And Jesus commands us to, to love one another. It's this particular kind of love, a new kind of love, uh, an other-centered love. A kind of love that says, you might not be like me, we might not have anything really in common, um, it might be a bit awkward and, and hard when we are in the same place, but I'm going to choose to love you, not because of what I get from it, but because Jesus has commanded us to love one another in this other-centred way. And so today we're talking about what do you do when actually that starts to go wrong? What do you do when someone else doesn't love you in the way that they should have done? When they make mistakes or when they actually deliberately do some things that are hurtful, when they do them over and over again, get into the patterns of these things, or when you find out that actually someone you love has something in their past that you don't love. What do we do then? And the answer is, of course, that we are meant to forgive one another. But that's not the only option, and I think it would be, uh, be remiss not to kind of think about some of the other things that you can do when someone wrongs you. Um, we don't want to miss out on some of the great classics. There's Revenge, that's a uh, particularly good one. We've got some fans of Revenge in, in the house. Um, yeah, you, know, you, you can take Revenge, you can go after someone, uh, make them kind of know how it feels, go a bit Liam Neeson on them. You know, if someone breaks your SNS plate, then your response can be, you know, I have a very particular set of skills. Um, you know, you go after that. That's, uh, that's a big thing for me. Uh, if you're not so into the whole revenge thing, there's this punishment. You can do it properly. You can go through the, the proper channels. We've got a legal system. You can sue someone. You can, um, if they've committed a criminal offence, then you can have them prosecuted and try and, um, you know, if someone does something wrong, it feels fair. You know, I think we have this kind of innate sense that it, it's fair that if they can't pay you back, then they shouldn't be able to enjoy things as well. Um, that, you know, if they can't pay you back for your MS plate, then maybe they should be put in prison for three years. Like that, you know. <laughs> they shouldn't get to enjoy things when you're still mourning that, that loss. Um, what else have we got? We, we've got ghosting. Um, that's, uh, that's a good one. You can just ignore people, just cut them out of your life. Um, and I think you can lovingly ignore people. It's not like you're actively being horrible to them, you're not trying to take revenge or something like that. You're just saying, I don't need this, I'm going to step back, I'm not going to have anything to do with you anymore. That's an option. Um, Cancelling people, that's kind of a, a big one these days. And you sort of trying to de-platform them, you might even um, try and have them sacked from their job or not able to kind of keep having a, a voice in certain spaces and that's a, a way that a lot of us maybe um, feel we can, we can support that. It's not so much that we're trying to punish them, we're not trying to get revenge on them, we're just trying to protect everyone else, we're trying to love everyone else and protect them from dangerous ideas, dangerous behaviours, it's a kind of a protective thing which in the grand scheme of things is more loving. Or uh, kind of the final one I can think of is you can negotiate, um, you can handle, you can bargain, you can make a deal, um, you can seek reparations um, for someone breaking your, your plate. I'm just, I'm fixated on this plate thing. I don't know, that speaks to me somehow. Um, maybe someone broke my plate once, I don't know. Um, yeah, you can negotiate, you can get people to kind of make it up to you. Uh, and in, in a way, lots of these things are um, a ways that actually we might use to have that sense of someone making up for the wrong that they've done, whether that is by taking it into our own hands or through kind of the justice system. These are ways of trying to level the playing field, trying to settle the scores, make things fair again. Or you could let people off. That, that's the other one. You could just do nothing and let them kind of get away with it. And then we've got the Bible's answer, which is forgive. But what does that have to do with these other options? Are they mutually exclusive? 
is forgiveness its own kind of thing? Is it a separate way? Uh, does it include some of those? Can you have forgiveness and punishment? Can those match up? Can you forgive someone but still remove them from your life? Still kind of step back and, and not have anything to do with them? These are important questions. We need to understand what is forgiveness and how does it fit with all of these other ways that we may choose to respond when people fail to love us in the way that they should. We've got a couple of places in the Bible um, where we're, we're told to forgive. Um, one of them is, is the Apostle Paul, and so he's one of the kind of founders of the church, and he's writing to a church, uh, and he says, says this, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. That's, that's the command. If anyone has, a, if you have a grievance against anyone, you should bear with them and you should forgive them. In terms of what it looks like, I want to talk about a story that Jesus told. And it's a story he told when one of his disciples asked him, how many times should we forgive people? And and Jesus went on to tell this story about what forgiveness actually looks like. And I think this is some of the most helpful and clear um, language that that the Bible has to talk about forgiveness. And it's in terms of debt, financial debt. So the story that Jesus tells is about uh, a king and a man who is in debt to the king. He probably worked for the king in some way, some sort of tax collector kind of thing, was meant to have collected a load of taxes and passed them on, but but he doesn't. This guy's actually um, in debt to the king by 10,000 bags of gold, um, which is, that's a lot of bags of anything. It's definitely a lot of bags of gold. And what the king says to this guy who can't pay him can't pay him these bags of gold is that he's going to throw him and his wife and his child into slavery, a kind of a bonded slavery where he's going to be working back and paying off that debt through through his labour and his suffering, I suppose. And the man doesn't like that idea, so he falls to his knees and he pleads with the king. He says, give me more time, give me more time. And Jesus is telling this story and he says that what the king does He tells the man to get up, and he says, your debt is cancelled. And that's this picture of forgiveness. That's how Jesus tells us what forgiveness actually looks like. It's about a cancelling of a debt. And it makes a lot of sense in that kind of financial way. If you owe someone something, if um, if you have broken something that that is theirs and you've got that kind of debt created um, or if you have stolen money from them or if you were meant to to pay them for some services or whatever, we understand that kind of debt and the idea that if the person who um, you're in debt to chooses to cancel it, then they're forgiving that debt. What they're saying is that actually you no longer owe me anything. I've looked at that, I've recognised that you, you owe me something, there is a debt there, but what I'm going to do is actually, we're going to draw a line into that. And the way that I'm going to treat you going forward is to say that that's been dealt with. That's no longer going to be what defines our relationship, this cancelling of a debt. And so it works, it makes a lot of sense in that financial way. But I think we can take this parable and we can expand that because whenever there's some kind of wrongdoing, there is, in a sense, a a sort of a debt that is created. Maybe it's a a debt of of our pride when someone wrongs us, a debt of sort of safety and, um, and comfort and trust. We have debts of trust where actually that's been broken. Um, reputation, happiness, we can just owe you always the debt of happiness. And so to forgive those things is to cancel those debts. It's to say that that has been dealt with. You don't owe me anything for that. You don't have to make it up to me. We've drawn a line under that. So it's really interesting to think about what that means that forgiveness is not. Because what the king doesn't do is he doesn't make a deal. 
He very specifically isn't saying, right, well, I feel sorry for you, so pay me back as many bags of gold as you can. Or pay me back a hundred bags of gold a year for the rest of your life. And I'll forgive you the rest of it, but just do whatever you can. It doesn't say, uh, fine, let's make a deal, I'm going to cancel this debt as long as you put me on your Instagram story and everyone knows that I'm a really cool king who's really kind. Um, there's all these different ways that we could make deals, and actually I think we do try and make deals, and sometimes we, we say that we've forgiven someone. We say that, actually, if you make it up to me, if you do this, then I'll forgive you. And that's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is about just cancelling that debt. Which means that the king is absorbing the cost of that himself. He's saying that I am going to be 10,000 bags of gold worse off because I want to cancel this debt for your sake. He doesn't benefit from it. The king doesn't benefit from that. It's not about him. It's about freeing the man that is in front of him. Has this opportunity to decide what am I going to do about this wrongdoing? And he says, I'm going to pay the cost. Forgiveness is, is not about making a deal, but about cancelling a debt. Philip said last week that if loving one another isn't costly, then we ain't doing it right. And I think that's so true. I think that comes into forgiveness. In, all these different ways that we can deal with wrongdoing, that we can get to a, a point where we sort of say that an issue has been dealt with. If it hasn't cost you something, then it wasn't forgiveness. It was another way of, of dealing with that situation. And the particular way that we're called to deal with these things is through forgiveness. I, uh, I really related to, to that video that, um, that we had from... Uh, those guys from um, Sam and Ellie and Susanna just talking about that, that time in, in their house. Um, I was going to tell a, a similar story actually. Uh, I'm the hero of the story, which is good news. Um, I was, it was a pretty, pretty terrible situation. I was also living with a bunch of Christians, which sounds really good on paper. A um, couple of things you probably should know about me before I, I get into the story, just context. There's only really two things that I care about in life. Many of you know this. They are to one day own a corner sofa. And, yes. um, so that's just, you know, keep that in the back of your mind. Um, so I was living, living in this house, and I used to do these sort of 13 hour days at, at the church that I was at. Um, and the thing that would get me to the other side of that uh, was, was thinking about the beautiful dish that I was going to cook up on the other side. What was I going to have? my dinner. On this particular Sunday, um, what I'd settled on was I was going to have a creamy fragrant chicken tea for myself. It was going to be oh, so good. Um, so good. Uh, nice. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, anyway, so, so I still do that. I do that in work. I do it everywhere. Anytime I say so good, I then say it again and I look like an idiot. So, uh, and I think of Alan and it's just this whole thing. Anyway, um, so good. <laughs> nice. Should have been there. Um, great. Right. Well, what did I say? Um, we going to make this, this curry. How the ingredients in the fridge. Um, it was great. And, and while I was living in this, this house, I, I started to feel like I was going a little bit mad. Um, there were times when I'd go to the fridge to get a can of Coke that um, I thought that I'd left in there, but um, it wasn't in there, so I guess I must have drunk it some other time. Weird. I made dinner and put loads of it in the Tupperware, put it in the fridge for the next day, go back to it, and I felt like there wasn't as much of it as I thought there was. Kind of like, why would I fill up half of the Tupperware? I don't know. And I felt like I was going mad. And I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you are thinking that this must be the housemates' fault, right? Like, you know, you've had housemates, you know these things happen, but you've got to remember these were nice Christian housemates <laughs> who were doing a nice Christian gap here. And so that's just, that's not possible. We made a very clear agreement that um, we would share milk and we'd share butter. And if there's anything else, then just like, you could, you could have it, but just pop something on like the, the group chat and replace it just so we knew what was happening. And mostly so that I didn't get my heart set on opening the fridge to find my chicken. And I mean, that's what happened. I, I got back from church. 
got a pan on the, on the stove, was boiling the rice, go to open the fridge. The thing that has got me through the whole day, we didn't have a corner sofa, so it was, <laughs> it was the thought of this chicken, and I opened the fridge, and just the, the cold knife of betrayal plunged <laughs> between my shoulder blades. And up until then, I, I'd maybe been naive about the, the missing things from the fridge, but this really, uh, it really hurt. And I knew who it was, I knew which housemate it was because he and his girlfriend were the only ones in the house that evening and I could still see the remains of the fajitas that they had made. I don't know if you're familiar with the recipe for um, chicken tikka masala, but it, it really sucks if you don't have chicken. Um, <laughs> yeah, so anyway, there are various ways that I could have responded in this situation. I could have made a deal. I could have said, right, actually, you owe me some chicken, can you walk to Asda now, get me some chicken, and we'll be, we'll be even. Throw in a, I don't know, a bottle of coke for good measure, whatever. Could have made a deal. I could have uh, taken justice into my own hands, and I could have just taken goods from the fridge up to the value of £3.50. <laughs> That's another option. I could have found my housemate and punched him in the face, like he rightly said. But I didn't do any of those things because they wouldn't have been forgiveness. What I did was I said, How are we for eaters? And he said, They're great, thanks. And I went to my room and I cried. Um, but I paid the cost of that. If I'd done any of those other things, it would have been making him pay the cost of, of making up that situation, whether that would be by making him buy me chicken, or by taking from him, or by, by punishing him in some way, or if I had ghosted him, or if I had actually gone around and just told all our friends that, you know, you can't, can't trust this guy, don't have any house, don't, don't have anywhere near your food, he's going to take it. I could have done those things, but that would have been putting the, the cost of that onto him, and, and that's not what forgiveness looks like. So why is it that this is the kind of the particular way that Jesus and, and Paul and the rest of the Bible tell us that we're meant to go about dealing with, with wrongdoing? And I think that it's, um, it's to do with the, the end goal of all of this, the end goal of being in relationship with one another, which is to be in relationship with one another to be in happy and healthy relationships with God and with our fellow people. That's the story of, of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. The first book to the last book is that God creates us to be in relationship with him and in relationship with one another. And those are meant to be thriving, they're meant to be healthy, they're meant to be happy. And it goes wrong. And we see throughout the Bible all of these different ways that people try to deal with it. But... The, the thrust all the way through of the, the story that God acts out is towards this vision in Revelation where actually there's a new creation and we are part of that new creation. And there are two ways that we could be part of a new creation where there is no more suffering and there's no more pain and, and there's, there's no more tears, there's no more conflict. That's, that's not true. There's two ways God could have done it. One was for us to not be part of it. And the other was for us to be part of it. But to be somehow reconciled. To be in right relationship with one another. God wants me to be part of that new creation. So I need to be reconciled with him. The problem is he also wants this chicken thief to be part of the new creation. <laughs> which means that I need to be reconciled with him. We need to be able to, to get on, to be in a, a good relationship. And the way that God decided that I was going to get there was by forgiving me. That's what Jesus does on the cross, is he comes into this broken world. He comes into this place where we owe all of these debts. It's like God is a, a master craftsman and he has made this beautiful one-off work of art, which is creation. And what we have done through various things is we've tarnished it, we've, we've ruined it. We've defaced that, that work of art 
And so we owe the creator of that art some kind of debt. And what he does is he cancels that debt. On the cross, Jesus pays the cost of it so that we can be reconciled with him. And he did that because he could have made a deal with me, but I wouldn't have had the funds. I wouldn't have been able to pay off that debt. I wouldn't have even had like, the right currency for it. It was so far out of my reach that Jesus looked at that situation and he says, I will pay it because I want to be in a right relationship. For one another is to pass that on, to pay it forward, to seek reconciliation, to be in right relationship, to be restored in, in this great way by paying the cost ourselves because we recognize that actually other people might not have the funds. If we try and hold them to these things, if we try and make deals, then what you end up with is this kind of downward spiral of saying, well, you can make up for that by doing this, and then they fail to do that, and so then you make a new deal. And it's just this downward spiral where people are completely defined by their past, completely defined by what has already happened.
before. And there's also other sort of circumstantial things and, and other things that, that go alongside that because sometimes our, our relationships change throughout the course of our lives and it's not because of any wrongdoing, it's not because of any unforgiveness. Sometimes you know, people who are friends in, in one season um, don't end up being friends in the next season and you just kind of grow apart and, and that's okay. So it doesn't mean that you're forever going to uh, have to be trying to get back to the kind of relationship that you once had, but it, it sort of shows you the general direction that, that you should be going in. I don't need to now be best friends with the kid that, that bullied me when I was at school because even if he was nice to me, we probably wouldn't be friends now. And so that's not what kind of restoration looks like. But if I were to get a new job and be sat next to him um, at, at a desk, then it would look like actually not looking to our past to work out you know, how am I going to build a relationship with this person going forward. So that's the, that's the order, and I'm very aware that there's lots of situations and probably some things that are on people's minds right now that it's a really tall order. In fact, the idea of forgiveness and, and paying the cost of someone else's wrongdoing and the idea of being restored to some kind of relationship with them sounds not, even, not just impossible, but most irresponsible. And I think there are situations where, where that is true. I think that, that that can be true. We're not always going to this side of eternity end up in, in relationships that, that are restored and where that kind of forgiveness is complete. And the reason for that is that the restoration requires two people. Forgiveness is a decision and an attitude and a way of acting that we can choose, we can take for ourselves, we can say, that's how I'm going to live. But to be fully restored requires them to also respond in a certain way, to gradually rebuild these things sometimes. And so sometimes we'll never get there. And I want to be clear, that's not always our fault. There are situations where we're not going to realise that vision and it's not what God is calling us to do because we've got to be aware that other people have, have a say in this. And if they are not responding in the right kind of way, then that's, um, that's a different story. And so there's a level of, of ambiguity here. Jesus actually um, introduces this himself, uh, I think, in, elsewhere, he, he's talking about forgiveness in, in Luke's gospel. And um, he says that if, uh, if someone sins against you, then you should rebuke them. And if they repent, then you should forgive them. He introduces this. Sometimes someone needs to repent. And that's a, that's a Bible word that we mean to stop doing what they're doing, to recognize that they were doing something wrong, and to, it literally means to like pivot, to make an about turn, and to start to go in the other direction. It's a, it's a, a big calling that they need to, to stop and change direction. And so Jesus creates space for that. But I think only in a few situations that, that that's really the kind of thing we're talking about. I think. 90% of the time in our lives, the kind of forgiveness that, that we're called to is the kind of forgiving people for smashing plates or for disrespecting beautiful food or whatever. Uh, and so in those sorts of situations, I think we need to be thinking about a bunch of other things where, where Jesus talks about forgiveness. And it's this, um, it, it, the Bible never says it all in one place. But we need to bear in mind a bunch of different things and then we're called to, to discernment, to working out which kind of situation is this. There's a lot of the Bible that paints, um, paints forgiveness as this sweeping, unconditional thing where we are just, we're just to do it. And one of those is this kind of the passage that we looked at in, in Colossians today where Paul says, if you have a grievance against anyone, then forgive one another. There's um, 
there's the passage that Kate talked about a few weeks ago um, about turning the other cheek. It doesn't say um, if someone strikes you on your one cheek, then um, rebuke them, make them apologize, and then turn your other cheek. It's this instant thing. It's this unconditional thing that actually just says, you know, I'm choosing to be a forgiving person. I'm choosing to be for you. That's my, my default. That's my disposition. Straight away, because I've, I've committed to having a life that is shaped in that way. There's um, uh, a little parable that Jesus, Jesus says, or um, he says that if someone, if a friend has a, a speck of like sawdust in their own eye, um, then don't worry about that when you've got a massive log in yours. It's about kind of hypocrisy and, and recognizing that we so often need forgiveness that we should be taking the initiative in, in offering that to others. We, there's um, just before the story that, that I talked about with the king and the man, Jesus is asked by one of his disciples, how many times should I forgive someone? Like seven, thinking that seven's a pretty big number. And Jesus says, no, 77 times. Seven being like the, the number um, in the Bible that represents completeness, fullness. He's saying it basically infinitely. You should just have an infinite capacity to forgive other people. And so I introduced this kind of, this exception that Jesus does leave space for us to require um, people to repent before we forgive them, but that's uh, an exception. And that most of the, the time, what we're talking about is that taking the initiative, that choosing to be sacrificial, to be other focused in our love in such a way that says, I'm going to pay that cost. I'm going to choose to to lose out here to to settle that score without being repaid for your sake to bring you freedom and we just need to be careful right because i don't know about you but i love i love being the exception to the rule i love to just think you know if there's if there's a get out clause if if it doesn't apply to some people and i like to think that i'm i must be that person it's nice to be the exception and so i just think we need to challenge ourselves about when is that true for us? It's a process of discernment. And there are two things that um, God gives us in particular for uh, allowing us to, to do that discernment. One of them is the Holy Spirit. The Bible isn't as clear cut as we would like it to be on so many things, particularly in the New Testament, particularly in how we're to live now. And the thing that it is clear about is that we should walk in step with the Holy Spirit. He gives us the Holy Spirit to guide us, to help us with that. And so if you have a situation where you're not sure if, um, if actually forgiveness straight away is, is appropriate or whether it's something where someone sh should be repenting, then the Holy Spirit should help us to decide what kind of situation is this. And the other thing that, that God's given us is one another. He's given us this community. He's given us wise people who can, can come alongside us and work that out. So what I want to encourage us to do as a community is to be people who commit to forgiveness. Commit to bearing that cost ourselves. Commit to taking the initiative and, and not requiring people to say sorry. Sometimes not even letting them know that they've done something wrong because actually we all do that and we don't want to be... Um, you know, pointing at the, the speck of dust in, in someone else's eye when we have our own things to worry about. But sometimes there are really serious situations, really deep hurt, and it's, that's when we need to walk through this with other people. We need them to come alongside us and to, to wrestle through this with them and with God, uh, to, to saying, what, does, what do these principles look like in that situation? How far should we be rebuilding and restoring this relationship? And we can do that together. So that's my... That's my challenge, I guess. I have no idea how much time I've used up. I have no idea whether to, to keep talking, so I'm not going to. Um, instead, I think, I think we should invite the Holy Spirit and we should um, just make space ourselves to reflect on some of this stuff. Lots of people will have 
we'll have come in here, carried in here situations where um, this kind of forgiveness is really challenging, is really tough, where the idea of um, paying the cost yourself feels unjust and you're not sure about it, where that kind of rebuilding and restoration seems impossible or, or implausible and let's let God speak into, into that space. But forgiveness is not about making deals, it's about cancelling debts. It's about bringing freedom to other people. It's not for our sake, but for theirs. And we do it because Jesus did it for us. Jesus has forgiven us of everything. He's paid the cost for everything. He's cancelled that debt. He says to us that I'm not going to define you. I'm not going to treat you based on those things. But let's look forward. Let's look forward with, with love. Let's look forward with, um, with a, new, a new start, a new chance. Restored trust, restored intimacy. Um, the band, do you, do you guys want to want to come up? Um, and maybe just start playing um, something if, if that's all right. Um, everyone else, if you're if you're up for it, um, why don't you just sort of stand up with me um, if you're able to? just going to pray and then we'll, uh, we'll see where we go from there. Father God, we thank you for your beautiful creation, for this story that um, you are so, um, so keen for us to participate in, that you've never given up on us that you have painted for us this picture of a new creation, a restored creation. A place where all is well, all is as it should be. Our relationships are, are thriving and flourishing. And that you're so committed to that, that you came and you experienced human life for yourself. And that on the cross you paid the cost of it all to free us from downward cycles to restore us to relationship with you we thank you for that God I just pray that you would help us in this moment to grasp something more of the the heights and the depths and the width of your love. A love so big that the, the challenge of this kind of forgiveness, the challenge of the kind of costs that you, you, you're asking us to pay just fades, just put them in their context. I want to pray for anyone who feels unsettled by this. That um, you'd make the helpful things that I've said stick and the unhelpful things just fall away. For anyone who has a really particular situation in mind um, right now, I pray that you would just give them um, just peace. Before we do anything else, God, I just pray for your peace, your peaceful presence in this place. I think let's let's sing now um just while while we let this sort of settle
or we let some things bubble to the surface and um, yeah a bunch of be um, ready to pray over here um, I might come back up and we might do something slightly different but let's uh, let's sing for now and if you would like prayer um, particularly for any situations that, that you have um, where you don't know how this fits where the challenge of forgiveness seems too much where where you think actually may, maybe this is one of those situations where um, there's a bit more um, nuance a bit of a different challenge a bit of a different calling on it then come and pray with us and we'll we'll see what um what god wants to do with those two things that he's given us for this the holy spirit and one another
sing the, the next songs we keep singing to just step out um, push past the people that you're with and come to the, the front um, the first group is uh, for some of you there's a really clear situation that's come to mind where actually um, what I've said feels right it feels feels like yeah that, that's what God's calling me to do um, you, you feel that actually yeah it's, it's time to set someone else free by forgiving them um, if that's you if you know that that's you there's a particular situation where this sits right um, then we'd love to just, just pray with you um, about that and the other people um, you've tried this you've, you've tried forgiving uh, and um, you've tried to, to bear the cost of this yourself but you haven't seen the, the kind of the fruit of, of that relationship restored uh, and you just feel like what more can I do what what else can I do what what does this mean for me when when I've tried it when I've tried paying that um, and we just love to pray with you as well. So if either of those things um, ring true for you, then, um, then come, and, come and join us. Um, and if you need anything else, if there's anything else you'd like prayer for, um, even if it's just that someone could lay hands on you and, and pray that you'd be filled with the Spirit now that we can do that, then come and do that as well. Um, that'd be great. And we'll just keep worshipping and keep pressing into His presence.
God that we have the most perfect example of love that we can know so close God thank you for all that you did for us and God I pray that you would help us to model that to others that we could be you in this world and that we could set others free and love others as you have loved us Amen Amen. Do take your seats, everybody. And there's more opportunities for prayer if you want some after the service. And just to let you know, again, if you missed the beginning of the service, I was just giving an announcement that next week we're not going to be here. So do pass it on. If you're on our emailing list, you will get an announcement which will tell you that we're going to be at the Cathedral School next week. So we're going to be at Bristol Cathedral School next week. So don't come here. Go to the Cathedral School. It's just opposite We The Curious. Same parking applies. So you can park for free in that College Street car park. So tell everybody that you know that we're going to be there. And we're just going to try it out to see how it works for us as a community. Also, don't forget Alpha starting on Wednesday. You can sign up. Um, do try and sign up before. Don't just turn up because sometimes they need to know um, how many people they're feeding. Um, also, just a bit of a shout to those who've come in at the end of the service because they were doing the noise. Well done, you guys. Congratulate them, everybody. Well done. And I know, I think, is it still going on tomorrow as well? There's some people doing tomorrow, so well done to you as well. Have fun. Don't get too sunburned, but I think the sun's gone in now, isn't it? <laughs> it's a bit rainy. Um, so um, I'm just trying to think, was any, there's another announcement. Yes, my final announcement is, um, after the service every week, um, we go to the steam room. Have I got that right? Just, just steam. Oh, my goodness, I really show my age. I don't get out much. <laughs> I'll go home. Right. I got it. I got it. Steam. Just steam. Just steam. So there'll be a little um, caravan of people <laughs> who will leave Metro afterwards, being led by the pub shepherd, who I'm not quite sure who that is tonight, but you'll see um, a trail of people going out. So go and enjoy being young at the steam. <laughs> at steam. The, at steam, not the steam. <laughs> um, anyway, so um, is there a song of your week? Yeah. Yep. So here it is, everybody, your song of the week.